Welcome to my podcast. This is WTF. My name is Mark Marin. <laughs> How's that? How are you? Welcome. Welcome to the show. My name is Mark. The show is called WTF with Mark Marin. Many of you saw that I reposted the Gilbert Gottfried episode from 2012. And um, <clears throat> I'll tell you, man, it's a rare thing in any field. It's a rare thing in people that you really meet somebody who is one of a kind, like truly one of a kind, like there's nobody like that guy. I mean, people are unique, yeah, and some people have personalities, right? Maybe I'm talking just in my field. I don't know. I don't think so. But the thing you got to appreciate about Gilbert, whether you liked it or not, or whether you thought it was a gimmick or not, or whether it wasn't for you, is that there was nobody like Gilbert Godfrey. True original, one of a kind, and I would say New Yorker. I would I would put that on him. He you know he came out of that cauldron, and uh, you know who he is, and you, well you knew who he was, but uh, there was no no one like him. True, true original comedic talent. He'll be missed. He was a good guy. That said, uh, I'm out here in the world plying my comedy wares. I'm tonight. I'm in Terrytown, New York at the Terrytown Music Hall. Tomorrow I'll be uh, in Providence. That's Friday. Providence, Rhode Island, the Columbus Theater. This Saturday I'll be in Boston at the Wilbur for two shows. And then I'll, I'll end up in Portland, Maine at the State Theater on Sunday, April 17th. And then the next weekend, I'm at the Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin, Austin, Texas, Friday, April 22nd. And I've got uh, upcoming shows in Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago, Minneapolis, Washington, D.C., and and a lot more. And I'll be adding some as well. So you can go to WTFpod.com slash tour for ticket links and other info. And look, a couple of things I need to... Remind people of it because of uh, I'm not going to blame anybody for anything. But the first one, you know, because of parasocial relationships or people thinking they know me or or uh, I, I have a connection to me that makes them vulnerable to catfishing, I guess it's called. There's if you follow me on Instagram or on Twitter, there is only one handle. There is only one account on each of those at Mark Marin. At M A R C M A R O N for for both Twitter and Instagram. If anything else comes at you from Instagram, someone messages you, Mark Marin four five six, Mark Marin official, Mark Marin authentic, Mark Marin seven eight nine, Mark Marin the official page. It's not me. Don't don't interact. Don't send them money. Don't give them your address. Don't sleep with them. Because it's not me. I would think that you would know that by the time you got to wherever you were going. And I don't believe that's what they're after. I don't know. Or maybe the lead up is enough for you. And you're like, well, I don't know. The I thought it was Mark Marin. I might as well just go ahead and go through with this. Just, there is no, there's only one account on both of those. And I'm not on Facebook. There's a fan page there. I don't have much to do with it. Okay, the other thing, buying tickets for shows. Go to WTFpod.com slash tour. Don't Google Mark Marin Portland, Maine, or Mark Marin Boston, because you're going to get scalper sites. I do not charge $300 for a ticket. Or get them at the box office. It's it, That's the only way you can guarantee they're not scalpers. And I think some of these scalpers buy up tickets and try to sell them. I'm the wrong guy to do that to. So they're just going to be stuck with tickets, and I'm going to be stuck with empty seats. But make sure you're at the theater's site or the the appropriate place to buy the tickets. All right? Just so you, I'm not, I don't want you to get priced out of something that I'm not pricing you out of. Okay. That said, Harvey Firestein is here. Harvey Firestein is here. And I read his uh, memoir. I was better last night. And I have a lot to say about it. But let me put that on hold for a minute. I just wanted to make sure that you knew he was here. So Paige Stark, who uh, has been an L.A. musician for years, and she had a band or has a band, Toshaki Miyaki. I, I met her through, I don't know how I met her. I think she sent me some records, or her people did. But anyways, we, we've we been playing together a bit, and she wanted to do. She wanted me to be on this record with her. And I, I, I don't know what the benefit is for, but I'll talk about it when it happens. But the idea was to find... Los Angeles songs. And I just didn't want to do all the any of the, the normal ones. So I kind of was poking around a bit and we found this song by uh 
Arthur Lee in Love, and um, it's called Sign DC, and it's a sort of dope heroin song, kind of dirgy, dark thing, and uh, I just recorded it in a studio. Very exciting. Playing guitar, singing, playing some harmonica. Not great. Not great on the harmonica. Pretty sloppy. I'm pretty good at the explosive slop. I think that'll be uh, the name of my record. Explosive slop. I guess that's kind of gross. It's kind of like kind of scatty. But uh, so that that happened. It was very exciting. Now, okay, let's talk about Harvey. Can we talk about Harvey? I don't always read the books, but I needed to read Harvey's. I didn't anticipate reading it all, but I couldn't put it down. It's a great book. Okay, it's a great book. Now, Harvey Firestein, you know him from Torch Song Trilogy, from La Cage of Fall. You know him from uh, Hairspray, the theatrical production. You may know him from Fiddler on the Roof. You might know him from Mrs. Doubtfire and some of his acting roles. He's been a gay activist for a long time. But he's Harvey Firestein. He's Harvey Firestein. He's a, 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 a singular, a force of nature. Harvey is. Now, I got to be honest with you. Now, I'm not coming out, but I can't deny a, a, a past and present fascination with the lives that the generation of gay men that Harvey is from had. And, you know, to be honest, there was a guy that had a profound influence on my life from that generation. Professor Gary Orgel. Now, I don't know what happened to Gary. I believe he passed away. And it's sad that I don't know that because I didn't really stay in touch with him because I don't know that the relationship we had was particularly appropriate or whether I'm comfortable with it in retrospect. But not unlike many of the male mentors I've taken on in my life, whether they be, you know, bullies or abusive or or sexually compelled, you know, I walk away from them, particularly with with uh with Gary and particularly with Sam Kennison these are people that had a profound influence on my life I don't know why I was kind of uh let loose in the world looking for father figures but I was I had a dad but he wasn't that present and when he was he was kind of explosive and boundaryless oh I think we just answered the question that's why but nonetheless Gary was a big uh tall gay man with a handlebar mustache uh, who always wore, uh, you know, uh, jeans that were very tight and like had a lot of cock showing and a suit and a little bow tie. And he taught philosophy, the guy. And I took an existentialism class in college. I guess it was probably my sophomore year of college. And I didn't know anything about anything. I was kind of um, nebulous identity wise. I always had my anger and my intensity and I think my sense of humor. But, you know, things weren't going great for me sexually when I was younger. But uh, I guess I had some juice. I had that young dude juice, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't have much game, we should say. So Gary, he was this big dude who had a big presence. He used to be a lawyer, a Wall Street lawyer. He come from a family of uh, New York real estate, uh, a bit of New York real estate and a hardware store. But nonetheless, I, all I remember is that his, his family, his mother's family once owned the building that Carnegie Deli was in. But... He was a very charismatic guy, charismatic teacher. I didn't know anything about existentialism. I'm not sure I do now. I don't think the papers I wrote made any sense. I don't think I really wrapped my brain around it. But I I was taken with uh, Professor Orgel because I want want to be like that guy, to have that kind of intelligence and that kind of wit and that kind of presence. You know, I was aspirational. So I, I guess I... You know, I showed up at class kind of eager, and I, I don't know if it was misread. I'm not sure I, I knew what I was putting out necessarily, but, you know, we went out to lunch, and we sort of became friends. Uh, I, in retrospect, and I, I think even at the time, I think he had a pretty big crush on me, but I loved hearing the stories. That generation of, of gay men have the greatest stories. I, why wouldn't I be fascinated with you know just fucking in the bushes why wouldn't i be fascinated with you know guys walking around in drag why wouldn't i be fascinated with leather you know dudes wearing the leather you know i saw cruising when i was in high school i had no idea what that was i did not feel gay but i did feel sort of like man this is a fucking life these dudes know who they are and that is true they did know who they were but i just always found it fascinating 
uh, the lifestyle of the guys that defined the gay community at that time when it needed definition. And part of that definition came explicitly from the sexuality because they had to you know, plant themselves like that up against a very repressive world when Stonewall happened and when, you know, they had to say, you know, fuck you, we're here and this is what we are. This is who we are. This is what we do. The whole thing was just electric to me, though I didn't want cock. Now, I'm not saying I didn't make out with a guy or two at different points in time, maybe a stage troupe party. <laughs> I'm not going to deny or confirm that. But nonetheless, you know, Gary became sort of a mentor, but not really a mentor uh, uh, academically, but just lifestyle wise. He was the guy, the first guy I knew that kind of taught himself how to cook. We, you know, he'd have dinner parties. I'd be over there. We'd go over there for dinner. Me and my girlfriends went over there for dinner at different times. And just a guy that was very capable and sophisticated, liked classical music, which I never took to. But just the way he owned space and was, uh, you know, a good cook, a good raconteur, you know, some, seemed to be elevated in terms of his understanding of things, owned a building. I don't know. He was a powerful presence in my life. And I remember one time I stayed at their house. He was uh, living with a guy named Michael. They were a good couple. Great, age appropriate. Uh, couple of uh, old gay dudes. I don't know if I was doing comedy. I don't know what era it was, but he was living with Michael and they came. I don't want to tell him. I've told this on stage before. Maybe I haven't in a long time, but I'll tell it to you. Um, so they come home and they're all leathered up. They're all like the chaps and they got the jackets and they're wearing hats and they're shit faced. The two of them, uh, Gary and Mike. Uh, Michael, Michael, who is the bottom. And um, they're just drunk. And I was sitting there at the table, you know, I, I, I had, and I was uh, reading. I don't know what I was doing, but they came home drunk. And I'm sitting there and I'm just staying at the house. And uh, Michael just, you know, he he gets on his knees and Gary's standing right there. And he's like, just pee on my face. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. And uh, Gary's like, I'm sorry. Hey, we're we're going to go to bed. And, and Michael's like, please just, just pee on my face. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to pee on your face. And I, it, this went on for a minute. And, um, but there was a moment there where I'm, I'm, I, I, and this is a self judgment. And also, you know, it might be a little bit homophobic, but if this is homophobic, what I'm telling you right now, I'll, I'll own it because there was a moment there. It's like, why don't you just pee on his face? I mean, it, it wouldn't make you gay peeing on a guy's face you're just peeing on a guy's face i mean you could have that experience i did think that but i chose not to but um but then he asked me he's like why don't you just pee in a cup and leave it for me i'm like that that doesn't sound fun i'm not doing that then eventually they went to bed but good stories exciting life and harvey's book you know goes all the way back you know to obviously he was to the 50s but you know he was there through all of it through the Warhol stuff through the experimental gay theater, through the drag, through uh, Stonewall and on and beyond. And he started in a very kind of crazy late 60s, early 70s gay theater scene, experimental theater scene. I knew none of this. I knew him as a mainstream guy. I knew him as the guy that kind of mainstream drag for uh, mass consumption. I knew him as a character. But, I, you know, his story is great and entertaining. And he's of this generation of gay men that... They're not that many around anymore. There's, these stories are rarely told shamelessly in the circles I run in, which are small. But it was great. It was a great book. And it's a great story. And he, 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 I just, I love an old shameless gay man who will tell those dirty stories. That said, Harvey showed up and, uh, and I sat him down and we had this conversation. Uh, his new book, which I highly recommend because I enjoyed it is uh, I Was Better Last Night, a memoir. So this is me talking to Harvey Firestein. If you don't know Harvey, you're going to know him pretty quick. You want to wear cans? You want to wear headphones? I won't be able to hear you. There you go. It's become there you a go. problem. <laughs> I, yeah, I turn it to NPR when I put these on. You do? Yeah, it becomes. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> the price of the price of soybeans will be the comforting 
It hasn't been a good year for rain. The comforting tones of Harvey Firestein. Exactly. I'm here to make sure you, <laughs> you don't think the world is ending. Get some rest. Get some rest now. <laughs> is the world ending? Seems like it, right? How are you feeling about it? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with it. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> You've had your time. I, exactly. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's the next adventure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm going to turn 70 in June. 70, yeah. 70 in June. I've been dead twice. Yeah. So, yeah. it's not all that. It was but nice. that, it seems like the next one will be for longer. <laughs> but I won't know. I know. I think about it more as I get older, uh, obviously. How old are you now? 58. I'm not that old, but I think about it. Yeah, you're old. <laughs> well, I mean, in, te- in television land, you're old. I know. What is it? What I mean, they 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 they're like twenty five, twenty six. They 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 don't give a flying. I fuck. don't even know. I don't know who anyone is anymore. I can't. No. I, they, I mean, that's what I notice happening. Is that like I, you think you're part of it? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're like, who the fuck are these people? Yeah. No. I, I have a well, like I have a I have a way around that. Oh yeah. What is it? Take on icon status. Well, I can't. Well, I can't just you know decide that. Oh well, uh, yeah. No, but the first time somebody calls you something like that, a legend. Uh, yes, uh, just embrace it, and then you don't have to know who anybody is. My mother <laughs> could never remember anybody's name. Yeah. So everyone was darling. Yeah. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. <laughs> this woman from Brooklyn. Hello, darling. Yeah. So I so I pick that up uh, rather early and call everybody Cookie. Oh, that's good. Cookie. Everybody's Cookie. I like pal. You like pal? Well, I mean, it's kind of, you know, pro, you know, it's working class. It's better than guys. Hey, guys. Fellas. Guys. What's up, fellas? You yeah, fellas are there now, fellas. <laughs> Definitely not in my world. <laughs> fellas in my world, is it's like you've already pulled down the zipper. You know? But cookie is fine. I like cookie. Cookie means I could fuck you. Yeah. I could not talk to you. Doesn't matter. You're cookie. <laughs> you it's not, once you say "Hey, cookie," it's it's on them to to. Yeah, to it's they, they they they. You do what you're gonna do. Yeah, you've complimented them in some way. Cause yeah. who doesn't like a cookie? That's right. I, who don't like a cookie? <laughs> Everybody likes a cookie. Absolutely. So I read the whole book. Oh my God! You're I, the one. I am. I'm gonna do that someday. Well, well actually, I, I actually had to read it for the audible. But I read the whole. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a process, isn't it? Oh, God. When you be, oh, oh my, oh, how many breaks did you have to take? Uh, well, uh, they told me it would take three days. Yeah, because I'm so dyslexic. It took me six. Oh, really? That's took right. Me, well, it took me five days, and then I went back for a day of pickups. I, uh, I don't, you know, I don't always read the books, but like I wanted to at least browse the book because I'm not, I'm not a huge theater guy, but I know you because right. you're an icon. And <laughs> thank you, Cookie. <laughs> And uh, oh, as my mother would say, "Thank you, John. You're, you're welcome." <laughs> uh, but uh, but I ended up reading the whole thing. It's it's beautifully written, and it's uh, it's engaging, and it's like you're thoughtful. I mean, it's not like it, you didn't just uh, you didn't you didn't just uh, you know do the thing. You didn't you, you got into it, and you, you you revealed parts of yourself. And I think I think what happens when I've written things mm-hmm. is it felt to me like you were learning about yourself as you wrote about yourself. Yeah, maybe. I, I, well, I, as I said, I took Shirley MacLaine's advice. Yeah, she's written like nine of these. I know. So I, I figured, know. Well, who the fuck better to, right. to listen to than somebody? one for each life? Well, no, I think she's had many more lives than that, well, but she got bored. Yeah, um, but <laughs> you know how that cookie is. Uh-huh. So um, she said, "Let memory be your guide." Right. Let memory be the editor. Right. Um, there may be other books down the line. Yeah. But follow the line of your of your memory. Yeah. As it takes you through this, and I said, I worry less about myself because I'm the one who decided to do this. Yeah. So it's okay to tell any story I want to tell about myself. Yeah. But how do I handle telling stories about other people? Sure. Especially the dead ones. Yeah. Especially the ones who died in their twenties and their mm. teens who will never get to tell this story. Yeah. And I have this responsibility of telling this story. And she said, once again, let your memory be your guide. You're never, when you're writing a book like this, you're never really writing about anybody else. You're always writing about yourself. Yeah. Uh, and how they affected you. Right. So it's really the opposite of what I actually do for a living. Because when you write a play or a movie yeah. or whatever, it's bad writing if the audience can figure out which one is you. Right. 
you, right. you need to be writing your characters. You need sure. to be true to your characters. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then there are a lot of bad writers. We're in Hollywood now. It's not really a secret here. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of really famous writers yeah. who are absolutely awful. Sure. Who only write one character and everybody else just gives them lines. Right. Just feeds them lines so they can be the hero. That used to be called television. It is still called television. <laughs> I can still name the name. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they're still the most successful people. Yeah, well, but that's not good, right? Yeah. And, and so um, this was the opposite. Right. This all of a sudden was, I don't want to hear anybody's voice but yours. And when you're doing that, you have to have a certain amount of, fuck it, I'm just going to tell the truth. Yeah, I, I mean, I, my experience with it in writing about my father, once he read it in the book, uh, it wasn't good. It was not. <laughs> no, it wasn't no. healing. It was healing for me, maybe, but like he took it personally. And then I had to question myself, my intentions. You know, did I do this out of spite? I mean, is it is the truth, yeah. but is it necessary? <laughs> I, well, I had, a, I had a couple of people like that in the book. Yeah. Um, one was Arthur Lawrence. Um, he's dead, but Arthur was the kind of person. That's that's my pants right Oh, it's you? Okay. So as long as it's me, I keep trying to turn everything off. And I and I should have. Yeah. Do you have a sensor? Is it is it a medical condition with it's, your pants right now? It's, it says the cookies are done. <laughs> Look at this a picture of of um, it's Charlie Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin, but it's me. It looks like me. It does kind of look like you. <laughs> you know, that's was, the way. That's Monsieur Verdu. Is that what it was called? Uh, yeah, it's that French. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put it on airplane mode. Okay, good. That should that do That turns it. everything off. That should do yeah. it, God damn Yeah, it. now we're flying. Now we're flying. So, yeah. um, where was we? Oh, yeah, so when I was writing about Arthur Lawrence, who's a mean son of a bitch, yeah. I also knew that Arthur had a real um, um, understanding of the truth. Yeah. And I knew that he, in the long run, wouldn't mind if I told terrible stories sure. about him. Because he knew they were true. <laughs> right. And he was the kind of person that, uh, in legend, because yeah. I have copied him in legend, yeah. in, in his, his living room, he had a drum table yeah. uh, with a, with a tablecloth on it yeah. and, a, and a, a lovely lamp. And surrounding the lovely lamp were little beautiful little frames, each one very different. Mm -hmm. And each one had a photograph of a friend of his. Yeah. And when he was mad at you, he turned the picture around. So you'd go in and whoever's picture was not showing your way, he was pissed at. That's the kind of gent he was. So I didn't feel bad about writing bad stuff about him. What was he, his job? Was he a producer? Uh, he wrote West Side Story. Oh, that guy. Yeah. He, yeah. Wrote, he wrote Gypsy. Oh, yeah. He wrote uh, Turning Point. See, he isn't wrote, that amazing that you had this experience with all these guys? I mean, that you worked with them? And that, oh, you know? are you kidding? Oh, I, I have had one of the greatest lives ever. That's why do you think I wrote a book? I mean, it comes, <laughs> it, it comes through in the book. Let me ask you something. Why, who decided to put the coming out story at the end? <laughs> well, thank you for ruining that for people who are about to read the book. But, Is that uh, a spoiler? I'm not going to tell no, the story. No, you're not going to tell the story. The, um, I had a fight with, with, that, with the interviewer who kept trying to tell. I said, could you please not tell the story? Oh, no, but I really love this. Could you please not tell the right. story? I want them to get it. Oh, but I get it. No, you don't. Anyway. Yeah. Cookie. Yeah. As I was writing the book, it came to me yeah. that that's where it belonged huh. because of the reaction to seeing Torch Song again 40 years later. And your brother. And my brother. And so... The only, almost the only note my editor ever gave me. Yeah. He never rewrote sentences. He never asked for this. He asked a couple of times, fill this in a little bit more. But the the only major note he ever gave me was move that that chapter to earlier in the book where where it happens. Uh -huh. And I said, you're wrong. Hmm. I said, I know this is theatrically the right place to put it and I'm a theater writer right so th that's where it stays and I think and I think it really hits people where it is well yeah, I think so because it's not it's not uh, uh, by virtue of your, your denial or anything but it's it's just unspoken throughout the entire thing exactly. yeah, because you have this great relationship with your mother right but this is what's at the core of uh, I think a lot of people's experience exactly and that's just it in my mind so many people admired my mother. Yeah. You know, she went out, as I say, she, for 30 years, yeah. she and her friends delivered meals on wheels to people with AIDS. I mean, she was in her 80s yeah. delivering meals on wheels. It's a woman who did unbelievable work in the world. And everyone thought, because I wrote Tort Song and all that, yeah. that we had the greatest relationship sure. in the world. And that it always was a great relationship. Yeah. And so they would be jealous of that. And I would never tell the story. Story really, mm. 
And then the time came to actually tell the story. My, but my favorite story about my my mother and and and, and being gay is still when she took my grandmother to see me in in Tortsong. <laughs> Can I tell that little story? Yeah, of course. So, so, so. This is the first run. Yes, uh, yes. The original Broadway, yeah. the original Broadway run. I mean, yeah. we had done it off off Broadway yeah. and all that, but we're on Broadway now. Right. And my grandmother's in a home because she was a little violent. Yeah. Uh, she used to try and beat my mother up with a cane. Yeah. But not, it was not. She didn't call her darling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I called her Granny Goose. Yeah. So anyway, so my, my grandmother's in this home, and my mother visited her almost yeah. every day. And she said, Jackie, what's going on here? All the nurses keep asking for who the hell is Harvey. They keep asking for his autograph. Why, yeah. why would I get Harvey's autograph? Why, 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 why do they keep asking for Harvey's autograph? Yeah. They seen him on TV. They read about him in the paper. Who the hell did Harvey become? Yeah. So she said, I, I need to take, I need to take um, <laughs> grandma. Who the hell did Harvey become? Well, you, I mean, because that was Harvey. Yeah. I was the weird kid at home that nobody ever thought would be able to make a living. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He was autistic. Right. I just, it was the polite word for gay. Yeah. Back back in the 50s. Yeah. In the 40s, I I, I think he's he's gentlemanly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. He's, that was yeah. We ha- always had nice words. Well, weird. They, uh, I guess the Jews had nice words. The, the Catholics immediately uh, drove them into the priesthood. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> and I certainly slept in with enough of them. But um, somebody, yeah. somebody said uh, on New York television yeah. said my favorite chapter was uh, of the, <laughs> it was on like one of those early morning of this TV book? shows of this book yeah. reviewing the books yeah. and my favorite chapter starts out by Harvey saying um, I, sl- I certainly slept with my, my my share of priests but I've yet to bed a rabbi yeah. and you hear the host of the show still off camera going <laughs> oh my <laughs> <laughs> Before he cuts back to her, it's my favorite part. Oh my! So anyway, yeah. so my mother decides she's not going to take it to see the first act because in the first act of Short Song, I'm in drag, right? And I get fucked up the ass for about ten minutes. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, standing center yeah. stage. She figures, eh, maybe too much for Granny Goose. <laughs> so she said, so she times it out to get her there for Act Two, right? Which all takes place in a giant bed, and then Act Three has the mother and all that. Yeah. She thought that'll be fine. So she gets in there. This is with act Estelle. Two. It's with Estelle. When Estelle was, yeah. when Estelle was there, yeah. but but Act Two, she's not in. Yeah. in it's just the giant bed right. with the two couples, okay. a gay couple and yeah. a straight couple. And so they're sitting there in the audience, and she's watching the show, and she's hard of hearing, yeah. and in the the loudest voice that has ever been projected in a, in a Broadway theater. She says, So Harvey's a homosexual. <laughs> and my mother, in a voice loud enough for my grandmother to hear her, said, How should I know? I don't sleep with him. <laughs> <laughs> Did that get applause? <laughs> well, I just fell over. Yeah, I was I was like talking on stage, and I just went boom it, it, in, in it, laughter. You did? That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to lie. That's what live theater is about. I know. Uh, the thing about this, though, that I didn't realize, and of course, you know, why would I? But for some reason, your life and it, it sort of tracks the evolution of a lot of stuff of theater, of drag, of gay culture. Like you were there for all of it, and you've seen everything change, right? But I had no idea that you know, in the seventies or in the late sixties, I the, I'm sort of fascinated with that period in New York, and nobody really talks about it enough, yeah. and you don't get any sense of it. You know, I watched a documentary on the Velvet Underground, but there's that whole world, but the gay world was uh, in, kind of like. Doesn't get enough representation culturally right now. Right. That, well, that it never part. does. Right. I mean, unless we tell it. Yeah, right. Nobody's going to tell and it. And you have to tell it. Yeah. And unfortunately, all those writers were so used to being in the closet that yeah. they didn't want to tell those stories. Right. You know, I mean, but but the Velvet Underground was a gay story. What's the case? I mean, I hung out with the Velvet on, on right. the um, uh, Mary Warnoff, who's like the the head person in, yeah. the, in that documentary. She right. starred in. We started oh, because it was Warhol, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Three plays together. And Lou was Lou. Did you know yeah. Lou? I knew him a little bit. He, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was mad at me when he died, which is one of those funny things. Oh, really? We did a benefit together at, at Town Hall. Yeah. And nobody went over the material we were going to do. Yeah. And so we both sang the same song. Which one? We sang Frank. It was about. It was about. Um, it was about censorship. Yeah. And we both sang the the folk song, uh, Frankie and Johnny. You yeah. Know, Frankie and yeah. Johnny were lovers. So he went on first, and I went, "Oh fuck! Well, I'll just go out and say hello to the crowd." Yeah. Whatever. And he sang his version. I said, yeah. "Oh, 
I said, I wasn't going to do this because Lou already sang this, yeah. but um, he didn't sing the right lyrics. He sang the cleaned up lyrics. Uh. I said, so, Lou, this is for you, and I sang the non-cleaned up <laughs> yeah. lyrics. And it was ve- and that was pretty funny. It was funny? Yeah. But he didn't, he didn't. He didn't like it. <laughs> So, okay, so you're a kid. He was heterosexual. Was he? Heterosexual men do not like being one-upped. But they he's, like being he, complimented. But was he heterosexual? Yeah. He was fucking Laurie Anderson all those years. I guess so. I, but yeah. early on, I mean, they, I mean, he had gotten, uh, you know, shock therapy to, to drive the gay out of him by yeah. his family. Yeah, so, but I mean, he, he and Laurie, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's no there's no black and white line. I no, mean, as we, as certainly. We know, yeah. there's, there's not no, now, yeah. He, well, not then. Yeah. I mean, we may have hidden it. Well, I mean, culturally, though, there's a lot of discussion about the, yeah. a non-line. Uh, well, I mean, but that's, uh, isn't that the most exciting thing going on now? Yeah. It scares the shit out of me. Why? Uh, the gender line. Yeah. The whole idea that we may... At this point in our lives, yeah. be redefining what is a man and what is a woman, and it's very exciting. Yeah, look, not very. Like I said, for a seventy-year-old person, it's a little annoying. <laughs> I have to call you what? <laughs> you're right. You're right. You want to be called they? Yeah. Why the fuck do you want to be called they? Yeah. And yet, it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily want to see. Broadway shows renamed, you know, like Golden Them. Yeah. Or, or yeah. My Fair They. Yeah, yeah. Um, or have every love song translate, you know, all boy, girl taken out, and yeah. it's all they, them. I'm not sure I like that, but, but I still find it incredibly exciting because it's redefining who human beings are. And can be, I guess. And can be. Yeah. And, which, of course, is what frightens the other side. Yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back. Right. Give me America great again. Right. America, 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 America. I don't want. I don't want to change. I'll go back. Give me my scrapbook. But there was. The, but there is no back, really. That's the weird. You, there is no back. There's always a mythological place. This, there, there is no back. Death is back. Yeah, that's all that's there. But but in terms of that conversation, I mean, you know, you. I mean, you lived your life. You yes. are who you are. Yes. You, you know, changing a pronoun is not going to change your experience. Yeah, and but you it does change how I relate to other people. Uh huh. Because as soon as you have to call somebody they or them, yeah, you do have to think about that. Uh-huh. I'll tell you a, a quick story. I know somebody who has it's a two two gay men. Yeah, they have a son. Yeah, who's ten years old. At home, their son is he, him. Yeah, no problem at all. Right. They went to a parent teacher conference. Yeah, and found out at school. He prefers to be called they, them. Uh Uh-huh. What do you think of that? I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Is he coming out in some way? Is he just do? Is he just falling in with a group of other people? So he's a trend. Yeah. It's. It's. I. I think it's utterly fascinating. Had and I try to think what I would have done then, Mm. and I don't know. People think of coming out as the act of of telling other people, mm. but that's not what coming out is. To yourself, Come, yeah. When you're a little kid, yeah, you live in your family, whatever that family is, yeah. And as you find your place in the world, that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my mother, that's my father, and you figure out where it is you belong in that. Yeah. Well, a straight kid figures that out and goes, "Okay, that's where I belong," and they go on with their life. A gay kid says, "That's where I." No, wait, that's not where I belong. That's yeah. not right. right. And they go back and do it again, and they do it again, and they do the math over and over and over again until they finally say, it's not the right math that anybody else is giving me, right. but it's the right math for me, and that's coming out. Right. It has nothing to do with telling other people. Right. It has nothing to do with even self-acceptance. It's figuring it out in your own head. I don't fit into this. I don't fit into that, which is why I find the whole gender thing so interesting. It's interesting, be- right, because there is a, there's a way to integrate. Is there? I don't know. I mean, well, that's like, what I'm saying. Isn't that fabulous? There the may not be. It. There may not be a way to integrate. We may be. You know, I used to talk to Gloria Steinem about this all the time. She's a great love of of the of the Native American yeah. idea of two spirit uh-huh. of, of of male and female being uh, existing in the right. in the same body. Uh, she has a great love of that, and, and 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 I do too. But I didn't know how exactly how it would work. And I'm not saying that they're giving us. A 
a way for it to work yet. Uh-huh. But I find it fascinating. I uh, The reason I even started up in the thinking, uh, as you know, because you read the book, I wrote a play called Casa Valentina. That sounded very interesting right, to me. Right, so Bob Balaban and, and a couple of others come to me with all these photographs of men in the 1950s up in a little... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, a place with a, b- a bungalow colony yeah, up in uh, the Catskills, in the Catskills yeah. where where these heterosexual married men go up on weekends and dress in women's clothing right. they believed they were heterosexual men that had a woman living inside them they called it the woman within yeah. they had their own magazines they had their own political groups and all that they thought this will make a great comedy. This will make a great, and I thought, yeah, was, you know, this is a lot yeah. of fun. But when I sat down to read the papers and I read their political statements, and I, there wasn't two of them that agreed on anything. Mm. Some of them wanted to dress up and pass as women. Others, it was about wearing the underwear. Never went out in public. Uh-huh. Some it was about masturbation in women's clothing. Yeah. Some it was about just looking in the mirror. Others, it was the photographs. Some swearing they were heterosexual would have sex with heterosexual men. Because I am a heterosexual woman, so I would, of course, have sex with heterosexual men. Yeah. So in this little group that you would think would be totally homogenous, no one was alike. And I thought, is it a lie? and I've come to believe it is, that we teach children brotherhood, Hmm. that we teach this idea that we're all the same, and we should accept each other all for being the same, that we're really all just human beings and it's just fine. That's never caused peace in this world. Sure. What about the idea that no one's the same? We're all magnificently different. Mm. We're all such individuals, a little of this, a little of that, and I will accept you for all of your differences and your uniqueness. Please accept me for my uniqueness. Let's stop trying to get ourselves into clumps, because as soon as you put people in clumps, then there's a clump you're against. It's your clump against somebody else's clump. But if you have no clump, then you can't war with anybody. I think it's a much smarter idea than the brotherhood idea. Sure. Well, because the brotherhood idea implies you know, that there's something uh, uh, that everybody's the same, and that 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 it's easier to control that. Well, and also, but as soon as you say everyone's the same, everyone knows that they're not the same. So which one's on top? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it becomes and it becomes the white heterosexual male. Yeah. You know, what, 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 Gloria Steinem and I, we had this battle. I was writing a play called Bella Bella about Bella Abzug. Yeah, are you going to put that up again? Um, we hope to. I mean, it was just done out here somewhere. Um, we, uh, it, we were hoping to, to, yeah. to raise money for women running for office, but, um, uh, uh, Gloria was wonderful enough to sit through rehearsal and, and give notes. Yeah. And I she got knew a, her and she was there. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was there on that particular night yeah. that I was writing about. She the was there. Night of, the eve of the election. Yes. Yeah, Shirley the McLean. Senate. Yeah. Shirley McLean was there. Marla yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Uh, Lily Tomlin. They Everybody, were all. And everyone's all still room. around, right? They're all still around. They yeah. all came. To, to either see the show oh, or great. to watch. Yeah. Even Hillary Clinton came yeah. uh, to, to lend her support. It was wonderful. Um, so, I'm do- so I'm doing a scene uh, in which I say, you know, um, well, as Bella Abzug, well, the Hispanic vote will go this way and the black vote will go this way and then women, well, as we all know, the women will vote the way their, their husbands tell them to. And Gloria stopped the rehearsal. She said, no, mm. no. I said, what do you mean no? She said, white women. Uh-huh. White women. Black women voted for Hillary. Yeah. Black women actually vote their own interest. So so then, okay, so then I get up and I say, and the white women will vote the way their husbands No. Who do you mean no? They don't need to be told by their husbands to vote that way. Yeah. White women will vote the interests of the people who pay their bill. Right. And they know that innately? It's that, yeah. She said it's it's built into them. Uh-huh. It's built into uh-huh. our society that women will vote for who pays the bills. What, well, that's like that's the big problem across the board is that our society is exclusionary and defers to you know white, you know hetero A patriarchal society, yeah, yeah. as opposed to the two spirit society or yeah. or the Native American society, which which of course was was maternal. Yeah, the women were in charge. But like when you were when you were coming up. 
in the in like in New York in the sixties. Yeah. I mean that there wasn't really a discussion about about any of this stuff. It was just all pretty wild and there was a freedom that was afforded to people from the from from just the tone of the culture at that time i mean how how crazy was it on the lower east side well i got because i went to art school because yeah. i went as soon as i was done with junior high yeah i grew up in the land of the honeymooners uh welcome back carter sure you know, and ben, you're out on the island ben, where are you in no, brooklyn ben, 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 ben yeah so that's the, and then i got out of there and all of a sudden i was on 57th street and second avenue with the boodles yeah and there were men in, in fur coats yeah and um and this art community I was living a, 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 a three-part life during the day or in the morning. Uh, I was this nice Jewish boy living at home. Then during the day, I was going to school full time because I, I went through college. Yeah. And then at night, I was in the counterculture. So you know, we would have. I, I tell the story all the time because it's it's one of those stories. I, I I'm in history of art class. Yeah. And the history of our teacher is lecturing us about an artist named Ray Johnson who's now creating this uh, movement called uh, male art. Yeah. And he takes a letter or a postcard and he draws on it, mails it to another artist, they add to it, they mail it to somebody yeah. else and eventually it comes back to him and that's the finished piece of artwork. And he gets his whole lecture. And that night, I'm laying in bed, and I said, "Oh, you know what, Ray? They 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 gave a lecture about you today." <laughs> so that was the life I was living. <laughs> yeah, you know, I they were talking. How about old were you? Fifteen, uh -huh. sixteen. So they were they were talking about that life, and I was living that life. I, you know, uh, whether I was w working with the Warhol people or just hanging out on the street or with the creators of the ridiculous theatrical movement. But those, but this was not like this. What year are we talking? Sixty seventies, seventies. So this wasn't a. Uh, this is post hippie. This isn't peace and love. This is like no, a kind of a, a aggressive avant garde pushing the envelope yes. stuff. Yes. And the, and the age difference at that time in that world, it didn't seem to make much difference, huh? Well, it did because I couldn't go into the bars. But what about the men? I mean, the men, these, some of these guys were old guys, and you guys were young guys. Yeah, but they, they that was what was amazing. Yeah. Was, other than a few pederists that, that, yeah. I, that I really loved. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? We've got to learn somewhere, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, but but um, uh, uh, when I'd go to a GAA meeting, the Gay Activist Alliance, yeah. they were not picking up the bus, young boys. Yeah, they were they were teaching us. Yeah, they would take us to the Pink Teacup, which was a. I remember that place. It was yeah. for breakfast, right? Yeah, breakfast, yeah. lunch. Yeah, it yeah. was a, it was a coffee it's shop. Not, where was that in the village? Where? Yeah, on Bleecker Street. It was painted pink. Yeah, nice right, off, yeah, yeah. off of Christmas Street. Right. So they would take us to the pink teacup, but they wouldn't try and take us to a bar. Right. And they wouldn't try and have sex with us. Right. They were our parents, like mentoring. They were exactly. Yeah. They were they were mentoring us, and and um, you know, and then you get older, you you do that for the next generation. Well, that's, it, that's why my book is dedicated to the radical fairies who flew before me. Yeah, I, and and it's a, it's a it's a history book in a lot of ways. But but I guess my question is the art scene and what became the activism scene. Yeah, kind of it, it seemed a little different at first, but then it kind of came together. I mean, I think you were part of that, right? Yeah, but it was you know nothing has such a clean, lovely line. You know, you had the Stonewall Bar, right? Yeah, this bar that drag queens hung out yeah. and, and and hustlers and all that, and the building right next to it, the windows. You know, if you're looking at the bar, the windows upstairs to the, yeah. to the left were the Mattachine Society. The Mattachine Society was a gay society that had been around since the 50s that believed if we wore black suits with white shirts and yeah. little skinny black ties that heterosexuals would accept us. So when Stonewall broke out, you had them screaming, shut up, listen to the cops, yeah. get back in the bar and all that, and drag queens saying, fuck you, Judy Garland died today, and we're going to kick your fucking asses for bothering us. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and now they came in a, in a, in a, in a kick line. Yeah. Um, it was not gay activists right. that believed in something and had ideals and all that. That's not how revolutions happen. Right. That's how they develop after afterwards. After the the big but, the, the anger builds up. Exactly. That's yeah. how, so that so that movement started in the sixties. Yeah. We then hit a uh, uh, strange sort of floaty period where where you still had the Madison Society trying to get our rights that way. You had the further left 
being, you know, we're, we're queer and we're going to yeah. get, get in your faces. Yeah. And then by 1981, AIDS hit. AIDS decimated our community, of course, but did some very important things, <laughs> which I'd rather it didn't do, but it, but it did. Uh, I'd rather it didn't have to happen from something like AIDS, but it did. It's just the way that history works. Right. Sometimes the negative gives you positive. Yeah. Whenever you'd go to a, a gay uh, a meeting, like at the firehouse or whatever, yeah. the first half hour was lesbians and gays fighting over who was going to speak first. Yeah. <laughs> was going to be a guy or a woman speaking first. And you'd waste a half fucking hour of this meeting, just them fighting. Could not get along on anything. Men couldn't go into women's bars. Women couldn't go into men's bars. We did just did not like each other. But you were stuck together. We didn't know that. Mm. AIDS came along. We could no longer give blood. We're dying yeah. in hospitals. We need blood. Heterosexuals will not give us blood. Yeah. Lesbians stepped in. They created something called Blood Sisters. And many, hundreds of thousands of lives were prolonged, at least, if not saved, by the blood of lesbians. I mean, physically. Yeah. By the blood. And that was the end of the war between the two. We became lesbian and gay. Yeah. During that. No one knew who gay people were. We were something they talked about. We were vampires that only appeared at night. We weren't normal people. Yeah. We were AIDS hit. And there's a line in, in Safe Sex which says, and, and suddenly we were everywhere. We're doctors and teachers and lawyers and priests and mothers and babies. Now they see us everywhere. Yeah. Hospitals, classrooms, obituaries. We were gay. And now we're human. That was a huge change. Mm. All of a sudden, we existed. Now, did they run away from us? Did they turn their back on us? Did they wish we did all die? Maybe. But we were no longer deniable. Mm. We existed. Yeah. And that changed everything. Back in the wars, we've, we've now got this war. We're fighting for our lives because, because of AIDS. And out come these young people screaming for marriage equality. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is wrong with you people? We have, we have so much other work to do. We've got all this crap going on to yeah. take care of. And you won't care about a fucking wedding cake. What is, where are your values? Then I stopped myself and I said, you know, these are younger people than you. And don't they have the right to define? what the revolution should be. Mm. And so I shut my mouth and I went to work for them. Mm. And they turned out to be right. These heterosexuals that thought we were out there to fuck their children yeah. or, or steal their husbands, yeah. all of a sudden went, oh, they want insurance. Yeah. Oh, they, wa they want to get a mortgage. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Oh, when their husband leaves them, they want to get they want to get alimony. I get that. Right. And all of a sudden, we won rights that we never would have won, fought on any other battlefield. Interesting. And now this generation, coming back to where we started yeah. this whole conversation, has brought up gender. Said we're now going to show you about gender, or at least question all of the roles of gender. Once again. I don't understand it, but I have lived enough history now to know, follow the young people. It's their world. Yeah. It's not our world. Mm. We should shut the fuck up. Yeah. The role of an elder is not to tell you what to do, mm. but even though people think that's what an elder is supposed to do. The role of an elder is to facilitate yeah. what young people want to do. That's the best thing we can do. Mm. So if I write my book, it's not to say go live the life of Harvey. It's like this is how I got there. Now take it the next steps. And do you see, like I understand what you're saying socially and culturally, and there's definitely a fight. It seems like right now we're in a more defined fight against what could become fascism than we ever have been. Right. But in terms of theater being vital and being important to this, uh, to the cultural evolution and language, it seems like back in the 70s, 
you know, before drag was accepted and you were, you know, doing experimental stuff or being in a Warhol movie, but, you know, drag was part of that world, mm -hmm. but it was a freak show to everybody else. Right, and now it's not. Well, you, but that was because of you. I know, but look at RuPaul. No, I know, but... But, but does look that at RuPaul's drag race. I have a friend... You, but was, that, but you, because of not me, no, but, but the but, whole bunch of my but generation. Tour song, but then Edna. I mean, like uh, Turnblad. That, I mean, that made it fun for the entire world, exactly. right? Yeah, but so did so did Charles Nelson Riley. Though he would <laughs> but never, no, he would. He, no, he wasn't. Listen, when I told my mother I had a date with Rock Hudson, I thought she'd die. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <That's> um, <laughs> But the the point is yes. the, the point is that you look at RuPaul's sure. drag race now. Those are not the same kind of drag queens we were. It's they are they are not. We were sexual deviants. We were we were scary. Yeah. You know? We were saying we are women and we are scary and we will scare the shit out of you. This was what in the seventies? In the sixties and seventies. We were experimental. We were in your face. We were there was something very dangerous about what us. What was the point? To to be who we were mm, in a world that, that was not going to let you. Okay. RuPaul's Drag Race, they're so fabulous. Yeah, yeah. They're wearing costumes we could never afford. Right. They, they can do their makeup. I mean, we, there's a scene in Hollywood, Lon's book, uh, you know who Holly was? She uh, wanted the Warhol drag queen. Okay, yeah. That Lou sang about. Yeah, yeah. You know, Holly came oh, from, from Miami, Miami FLA, FLA. That one, yeah. Holly. So Holly was opening in a movie, in a Warhol movie called yeah. Flesh. Yeah. But she was in the tombs. She'd been arrested, and they were going to let her out of the tombs in time to get to the opening. Yeah. And so she, she didn't have any makeup or anything with her. She was in the men's yeah. section, and she had to go to the, this Hollywood opening. So she took a colored magazine. And she took Q-tips, yeah. and she'd wet the Q-tips on her tongue, yeah. and take the ink off the colors pictures, uh -huh. and use that as to make makeup huh. to do the makeup. Yeah. That's not what I, what what RuPaul drag queens do. Yeah, my, my friend Bianca Del Rio, who's a stand-up comic sure. from from there, sells out stadiums. Stadiums, yeah. entire stadiums. She don't sing, she don't dance. She's a stand-up insult comic yeah. that sells out stadiums. Yeah, I know I know some of those people. It's a different world. Yeah. Well, another one from RuPaul's Drag Race, Nina West, um, who, who actually did me, was played me on the, when they do Snatch Game, is playing my role in Hairspray in the road company right now. Huh. So we've made incredible progress. Where we go next, I don't know. But we're, but we're, but we're not going backwards. We're no. always moving forwards. Sure, and that's what's fun. But I mean, that whole period—the sort of sweaty, angry wigs and makeup period in the seventies—and <laughs> then that the the entire like the 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 cultural change. I guess it was uh, mostly AIDS, but that whole world of gay sex that you write about. It to me, it's just like, oh my god. I mean, like, it was just, you just walking around fucking wherever you wanted, and just, like, kind of the, the uh, insane electricity of that world. I can't even imagine it. Mark, my love. Yeah, and what? Do you really think we aren't still doing that? You know. really think I can't take you to Central Park now <laughs> and show you people fucking in the rambles? Are they? Yeah, of course, the back of the ramp. <laughs> it's boys. Yeah. What do boys need to have sex? Yeah. A finger that can pull down a zipper. Uh -huh. After that, we just then we go for pizza. Yeah, it's not boys and girls. Yeah. Boys and girls takes work. You have to actually talk or something. <laughs> this is boys, yeah. the, and the whole the whole aim of having sex. Yeah, in that kind of kind that yeah. kind of having sex is to have sex. It's not to make friends. Sure, nobody's here to make friends. Yeah, people are here to fuck. Yeah, or or get a blowjob. Or yeah, I got to get back to work. My wife's waiting for me at work. She's not going to give me a blowjob tonight. I'll get a blowjob here. Yeah, but no, you think you would? I mean, L.A. Used it's to all back. Yeah, yeah, it's back. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, was it? There were there was big stars caught here in bathrooms in in Hollywood. Yeah. Sure, I, uh, maybe I don't. I, I guess I'm I'm not paying as much attention. Yeah, well, you, but, know, you, know, you probably have somebody who gives you blowjobs on a regular basis. I try to. Yeah, but but you know, but if should you ever need one, I'll send you a list of addresses. <laughs>
<laughs> you can just stop by. And, I need to start that phase of my life. Exactly. Just, you just stop yeah, by. I'm get 58. a blowjob. It's time to go to the, the shambles or whatever. Yeah, the rambles. The rambles. But it's, 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 what? There's, there's no age limit. But Pen- penises don't have an age limit. They don't wrinkle as bad as faces. I guess that's true. But I don't know if they work as good in the long run. Oh, they have pills. <laughs> they have pills for that cookie. I'm so sorry. You're 58. You're worrying about. Oh, that. I know. I'm not worried about. It. I know they have pills. I'm okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm hip. We're to, putting this out on this podcast. I'm hip Mark to the pills. Is okay. Yeah. I, yes. Mark can still open his zipper. And I can. I can do it. I can do it. Nick's a little work. A little well, more work. Wham bam. Thank sure. you, ma'am. See you later. My Jones is coming down. Yeah. So out of that world. What drove, because I know you write about in the book, but Torch Song Trilogy, which defined you at that time and, and, and also changed theater and it changed the representation in theater and in, in, and in the culture. I mean, that was something that was, you know, driven by, you know, uh, 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 an anger and a desperation to identify. How did it, was it come? It no ch- ch- Arnold, that character of Arnold, yeah. which, which was the character I played, he was driven by... Uh, 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 g- growing up in the same family yeah. that his brother did. You know, he grew up with a mother and a father and a brother, and the brother was straight, but he was dating. Yeah. And eventually he wanted to find somebody and have a child or whatever. Well, Arnold was raised in the same home because he liked to suck dick, means he didn't want a family or and you know the, the misunderstanding is there were gay people that thought i was saying we all have to do that yeah but i was saying the choice should be ours right the choice should be ours and so you had arnold who was trying to make this place this, this make a statement that his life was a value and had the same values in this as 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 his straight brother yeah um was seen as being frightening was seen by some as being revolutionary it was seen as some uh, as being a, a a different kind of a statement yeah which is fine but i mean even even in the play uh, arnold says i don't want a grade b imitation of a heterosexual marriage i want whatever this is really supposed to be yeah but i was attacked for by gay groups saying that you know, he just wants to turn us into heterosexuals. I don't want to have children. I don't want to. Well, I never had children. Believe me, raising Matthew Broderick was enough. I didn't have to have children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my kids actually all went on to greatness. You have Patrick Dempsey and, and, and Matthew and Fisher Stevens. and uh, Fisher Stevens. I mean, he's working a lot of, right now. Yeah, he's working a lot. Yeah. But those are my kids. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, but that's interesting that there's always this infighting. To me, that that they have to judge that that every. But that's what happened when AIDS hit. When AIDS hit, there were those of us who screamed and yelled, "Okay, this is going to be up to us." Yeah, we had no we had no heterosexual ally. Right, we had one person. Yeah, Anthony Fauci. Recognize that name? Yeah, that's the only person we had. Yeah, we had Anthony Fauci, and that was it. Um, so we had nobody to guide us. We had to decide. Should we close the baths? Should we insist everybody use condoms? Should we ins- you know the same crap, same kind of crap that you see going on with, COVID. with masks? And we and and gay people laugh at it. Yeah, you, know, you fucking pieces of shit. If we had a little shot to take with a booster, you don't think we would have taken our shot and gone on with our life? You, I mean, these big heterosexual guys are scared of getting a shot. You fucking cowardly <laughs> little pieces of shit. That's the way I look at them as pieces of shit. Yeah, these these ball players and all that. I don't want to be told what I do. You're scared to get a shot and just admit it. <laughs> fucking little faggoty ass piece of crap. So anyway, yes, we would be very happy to have been able to get a shot, but, sure. we, had the, but we had the same arguments. Yeah. Should we Should we insist everybody use condoms? We keep the bathhouses open so we can give out condoms. We we taught. These were community meetings? Community meetings, and, the, and we had... Because this yeah. is a New York thing. I mean, those the the, the kind of the well, defi- New York, San Francisco, right. L.A. It was spreading all across the country. But like those gay centers where the bath culture existed, and that culture right. was like known, and like, people traveled there to do right. that. Uh, you had someone had to create sort of a government in a way, right? And which of course you can't because there's no way you know to for first of all, who's going to be a lesbian or a gay man? Yeah, I told you we were busy having that fight. Yeah. 
We didn't have enough stuff to fight over. So you did, but ultimately the decision was to get people to wear condoms. Yeah, but but many people didn't, and yeah. they died. Yeah, and and now there's no cure for AIDS, and and we've turned our community into a community of drug addicts. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm very glad people are taking PrEP, and I'm very glad people have a drug to take so they yeah. don't Die. zero, and they don't zero convert, and that even if they have HIV in their blood, they um, they take a drug that keeps them from passing it on. I'm happy about that, but I'm not happy that they have to take a drug, and I don't understand why we still haven't found a cure for AIDS. Mm. I still believe, in my own naive way i still believe the drug companies like it that way they make more money of course they make no more money in a cure there's no money in a cure but you really believe that that you know, there's not people working i don't on it. I, oh i know there's people working on it whether they found something or not is, is, is something different we don't i don't have anybody to ask sure how do you do you ever have survivor's guilt of course. <laughs> yeah. I got three dead people in my backyard. Yeah. You think I don't have survivor's guilt? Yeah. Of course I do. And I write about it in the book. Yeah. The, I'll tell you when I was recording the book. It wasn't when I was writing it. Writing it was was fine. You know, you're in that head and you're just telling the truth and you're just do, going down your, your road. Yeah. But when I had to read it back is when it started hitting me. When I hit that sentence uh, that I sort of just described that said, and, and our heterosexual friends put their arms around us, gave us a hug, said, we hope you do okay, and they walked away very glad it didn't affect them mm. and left us to die. And when I read that sentence, left us to die, I actually stood up from the microphone and left the building for an hour because I guess, yeah. Yeah. That was a very hard truth to, to finally tell. And because of that time, like, you know, people, has, their families had turned on them. So, I mean, I would... Well, it was everybody, but I mean... I, <laughs> why do you have people in your I, backyard? I mean, what? how did that unfold? They like, wanted why? to be there with oh, me. Oh, okay. But, but uh, yeah, no, they just wanted to be there with me. But, but um, uh, Ari Melber yeah. um, had me on his show uh, to, to advertise Bella Bella. But he has two guests on. And they didn't tell me who the other person was. And I walk into the room, and it's Peggy Noonan. Yeah, and I just like looked at Harry, who I don't, who I didn't know at the time. Yeah. I know him now. Yeah, I know him now well enough to call him Cookie. Yeah, um, <laughs> and 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 I sort of looked at him, and he didn't understand. And I and because of the shape of the show, we we only had a couple of minutes, and blah blah blah. Yeah. It wasn't a discussion show. I had to poli be polite and be nice. All I wanted to do was slap that bitch. She wrote the speeches for Reagan where he never mentioned AIDS. Yeah. She was part of that decision to have yeah. the president of the United States not even mention the word AIDS because they knew there was no cure. They knew there was no quick answer. They knew it was a losing political battle. Sure. So fuck the people dying. Yeah. Fuck Americans being sick. We don't, we're not even going to talk about it. They can die on their own. She was, com and she was complicit. complicit she yeah. was the, she was the speech writer. You didn't say nothing to her? I, I just felt I couldn't. So, so a couple of weeks ago, Ari asked me to be on his show again. I just did it uh, yeah. the other day. Yeah. And yes. And I said, if you stick me with somebody like Peggy Noonan this time, I'm not keeping quiet. <laughs> yeah. And he laughed. He said, no, it'll be you alone. I said, yeah, you got to be careful about who you put me with. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. the days of my being quiet, yeah. you know, I'm quiet when I have to sell something. <laughs> yeah. I was telling, and I was telling, you know, I was also telling Bella Abzug's story. Though the truth is, Bella would have shot her mouth off. Bella wouldn't have sat there quiet. Right, that's for sure. She, you know, yeah, she's yeah. two lesbian daughters. She would have sat there quiet. Yeah. So, like, it seems when I, when I read the book that the way you learned how to create and 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 I mean, you work hard. I mean, I don't understand how these books work, but the half of this book is about you being confronted with material and making decisions on how that material should be staged and, and, and how the characters should act and how the play should come together. And that's something you learned instinctively from just working because I don't understand it, how, you know, creating a book really works. I think I talked to Lin-Manuel Miranda about it. Like, but when you did... Even the rem when you did Lacage or when you did uh, any of these shows that you know that needed to be retooled, is, is it just a sense of doing theater for a long time? Or no, no, there's an, there is an art to it, but yeah. it's a craft. It's a craft. It's a definite craft. Yeah, and I learned. I mean, I, I had written a bunch of musicals first, 
you know, um, earlier experimental musicals like Freaky Pussy and Flapper Stroska and Cannibals Just Don't Know No Better. Is um, Freaky Pussy going to come back anytime soon? I don't think so. <laughs> but, 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 that's, but that was a work of real political, that was a, that was a political statement. Because heterosexuals were, at that time, um, gentrifying everything. Yeah. They were closing down little gay clubs and turning them into nice restaurants yeah. and all that. So this was my statement. I took a subway bathroom that a bunch of transvestite prostitutes were plying their trade out yeah. during the winter. Uh -huh. It was cold out on the street. Sure. So they're working in a subway bathroom, and a, a couple comes along and turns it into a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, called the underground. Right, and there's nothing for these drag queens. They can't go to the police. Yeah, they can't. And so they have their own gay masada. <laughs> yeah, of of committing suicide. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, like one by one they commit suicide. See, that's some hardcore '70s satire. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't see that shit anymore, man. You do. There's, there are people still doing that kind of stuff. There's, yeah. Yeah. You know, Taylor Mac. Do you know who Taylor mm -hmm. Mac is? Taylor, look up Taylor Mac. Yeah. Still does. So you did right. musicals early on, but then you learned the craft. But then, but that, well, no, well, the craft for something different. Arthur Lawrence, who had written Gypsy and yeah, such yeah. stories, I said, um, and when he came on to direct Lacage, yeah, you couldn't help but learn. Sure, you know, you got one of the true masters in front. And of you me. were given that job, mean and horrible. Well, I had the job before him. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So I've been hired before him. So it was a I was put in a room. I'm not even 30, and I put in a room with Arthur Lawrence, who's written all this stuff. Yeah, and Jerry Herman, right? Who wrote Mame and Hello Dolly. So that's it. I mean, and it's me yeah. sitting there. If you fucking didn't think I soaked everything I could out of those two, it's crazy opportunities. The, the of course, way. it's crazy, and life gives you those opportunities. That's my whole philosophy. My whole philosophy is say yes if you can. Say yes. You don't know if if somebody says to you, "Let's go have coffee," and you're reading a book, you say, "Nah, I'm going to finish my book." Well, you can finish your book. Life is not going to get any better or change. But if you get your ass up and go have coffee, maybe nothing will happen there either. Or you might meet the love of your life or you might run into somebody else who says, let's go do something else. But it's only your life only gets better the times you say yes. Yeah. If you say no, nothing, what are you gonna do? Nothing, nothing, changes. Changes. nothing changes. And so when I was young, I said yes. And, many, and La Mama was so like at that place, I always walked by it. I never understood completely the history of it until I read your book about La Mama. Right. Like, uh, uh, and that woman, she took her you under her wing and, and let you do a lot of stuff. Right. And she only did it because she loved Paul Foster, who was a, a gay playwright, and Billy Hoffman. There were a bunch of gay playwrights. She was a designer for What's her name, Mace, Ellen? Ellen Stewart. Yeah. She was a designer for Macy's, huh. or Gimbals, or something. Yeah. She, she brought, she brought, brought the Moomoo in from Hawaii. Uh -huh. Remember the Moomoo? Yeah, that was her movement. <laughs> she made her money off the Moomoo. She went downtown, rented a space. Uh -huh. She had a push cart. It was there forever. It's still there. It's crazy. It's still there. And I just that, did a, I just made a video for their 60 something anniversary and I said, oh fucking, I was there 52 of those years. Yeah. So Lacage was another like sort of defining play for everybody, yeah. right? Absolutely, and then like, and then like, what, what was your biggest success in your mind? You don't know. No, I couldn't care, care less. You <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, you know, I said, to, I said to Robin Williams once, I said, I've done all this political work, I've written all this, this stuff, I, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. done all this crap, and when I die, people are going to say, oh, he's the guy who played Robin Williams' brother in Mrs. Doubtfire. That's not true. It is true, and it's and it's. Uh, if you don't think, yeah, how many of these things you think I do to sell a book? You know how many? Yeah. you're out on the book trail. I'm going to sell some books. Exactly. I like the book. And when you and when you're selling books, yeah. there's not a single person who doesn't ask about Doubtfire. Really? Yeah. They all I, ask about Robin. They all I, ask about Doubtfire. I, I barely so. remember that. I, you know, like uh, I know uh, you. You live in the garage. Yeah, I know. I live in the garage. But I but I was more fascinated with this. The idea. I've always been fascinated with the idea of. The, the the unity of the the gay community and what come out of it to maintain their community you know that that sexuality and identification right. was the means by which they were able to survive was right. always fascinating to me right and then and then one year I was on two, world tour doing my my one man show on world mm. tour and I, I think I say this which in show? the book uh, um, it was called uh, this is not going to be pretty yeah and uh, we we're we're in Dublin and we had the night off. 
Uh, yeah. and, and they said, what do you want to do? Well, like, we arrived in Dublin. We didn't work that first night. Yeah. And and I said, well, let's go into town and go to a gay bar. Yeah. And they looked at me and said, we don't have any gay bars. Okay. What do you mean you don't have any gay bars? We we got rid of anti-gay laws years ago. <laughs> yeah. So gay people go to straight bars. I yeah. mean, we're all mixed in together. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, How, where's my community? What do you mean? <laughs> my pe- I need my people. Oh. That generation's gone, though, right? But but you need that generation as well because when it comes to us being when we when we come under attack, there are three hundred anti gay laws now coming down yeah, through yeah. the courts. Three hundred. There are only fifty states. Mm. Since so an average of six anti gay laws per state, it's insanity. And uh, you know the uh, DeSantis. I don't know. He can't even go to Florida anymore. I know, but he's running for president on anti-gay. Yeah, that's he found one that works. Look, I'm terrified. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not even gay, and I'm. I'm a Jew, but I'm terrified of fascism. Yeah, well, it seems real to me, right now. Yeah, it, it is. And who is it coming from? Old white men. So we need the old. Somebody. Somebody said. I love. I think it was. I think it was John Oliver. He showed a picture of Putin. Yeah. And just looked at it and said. If he was just four inches taller. <laughs> he's funny. Well, but it's true. Kind you know, of is, yeah. He's an old guy wanting to be um, uh, 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 important again. And if he could just make the Soviet Union again, then he'll be remembered. I don't. Stop it. You've got hundreds of billions of dollars in gold in the basement. I don't know what the fuck You've got fuck these is. two lovely daughters. Go. Yeah. Take the rest why of your life keep, off. Why do they keep working? Why do you have to murder it? You have to murder thousands of innocent people to prove that just dick still works. Yeah, go fuck thousands of people instead. Yeah. I I just I don't understand it on any level why people continue working. Oh, why can't they? If they've got if they've made it, come relax. I, would, I I I laugh when I watch some people on um that have that have been on the news show for like forty years, yeah. and I think you haven't made enough yet. Yeah, I know. What do you still do? Right. We we'll go home, right? Go, go, have, and they say, "Oh, thank God, it's Friday." Yeah, it could be Friday every day for sure. you. Oh, yeah. You're not that good at this. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess people don't know what the hell to do with themselves. But that's what I mean about young people. Yeah, we don't make the room for young people to to take over, and we really should. I I, I agree. I okay. Let's, be, let's talk about a uh, uh, Tevia. Do we have to go though soon? I no. Can, okay, because I've I've got you know I've got people waiting for me. Where? Me and Billy Eichner. Oh, okay. Come That'll be fun. Us. We'll have fun. That'll be fun. He's funny. Yeah, yeah I just did, a, I just did a, what you call, I did a uh, cameo in his movie. Oh, yeah? I don't do movies. No more? I hate, oh, I hate movies. I always hate movies. So we're not going to talk about Tevia. Let's talk we about- We talk about Tevia. We love Tevia. You do, right? You loved it. You we never thought it. that would happen. No. <laughs> no, I, I love that part of the story. Well, you no, we, we were, they were working on casting. Yeah. La Casa Fall. A production that I didn't want to happen. Yeah, they were working on casting that. My friend Susan, and and she said I got to leave because we're also casting Fiddler on the Roof, uh-huh. a revival of Fiddler on the Roof. And I said, Oh, I want to do that. And she said, What? You going to play Golda? Yeah. And I sort of looked at her, and you could see she got she was very yeah. embarrassed. Right. That. Cut to a year and a half later. Telephone rings. It's Susan on the phone. Just promise me you won't shave. Until we make this decision. I said, what are you talking about? She's promising you're not going to shave no matter what I say. Yeah. All right, I won't shave. She said, I want you to do Fiddler on the Roof. I said, play Golda? Yeah. Why, do, why can't I shave if I play Golda? She said, not Golda Tevya. Yeah. And, I, and like everything in me just collapsed. Because this was a show I saw as a kid. We saw everything. Yeah. In those days, you can buy Broadway tickets for $3. Yeah. For two dollars and fifty cents, I have the stubs. My mother would buy every single show. My brother, my father, she and I would go we'd yeah. sit the first row of the balcony. Ten dollars for the family of four, uh-huh. and we saw everything. Yeah. So I saw a bunch of nuns singing "The Hills Are Alive," yeah. and I saw a bunch of orphan boys go, "Give me more!" Yeah. You know, I saw it all. Yeah. And then one day, a bunch of Jews. <laughs> They were Jews. They had tzitzes, yeah. and they had they had kippers yeah. on their head. And I went, "This fucking Jews," 
Because the Jews I knew, right. Danny Kay, right. they all changed their name to be in show business. Yeah. Everybody talked about Barbara Streisand. They said, oh, she'll never be a star. Not with that nose. Right. she have to get a nose job, and they're going to have to change that name. Hmm. So instead of changing the last name, she dropped the A out of the first name and said, fuck you. Yeah. Anyway, so so it meant a real lot to me Yeah. Uh, to see Fiddler on the Roof. And here I was being offered Fiddler on the Roof. And I said, I, so I called Jack O'Brien, who directed Hairspray. Yeah. And I said, Jack, what do I do? He's a very smart man. So he said, it's a very simple question. He said, you either do it or spend the rest of your life saying, you know, they asked me to do it with people looking the other way, like, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so then I went to the, I, I'm the last person to play Tevya with all three writers still alive. Right. The book writer, the composer, and the lyricist. I insist that the three of them sit in a room and hear me sing the entire score. Just for confidence, to make sure you could... Just because I didn't want them turning around saying, if I knew that's what he was going to sound like, oh, right. I never would have allowed yeah. it. And so and the three of them were, were always gorgeous to me. Yeah. And they approved my doing the show, and I did it for... Well, a, over a year on Broadway, I, I couldn't stay longer because I was booked to go to Las Vegas to do Hairspray again. Yeah. But then Topol, who did the movie, sure. was doing it on tour, and yeah. he got tired of doing it, and they called me and said, do you want to do the American tour? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? And I, and I did it for another year on tour. Did it make you, like, you know, given the, the other roles you've played in your life, what did that, how did, did it change you? So, the Minskoff Theater, where Lion King is now, is, yeah. where, is where we played. And you come out of that theater, and there's a alley that's like a, an underpass, mm. and that a stage door, and that's where the audience waits for autographs. And on Wednesday matinees, for whatever reason, yeah. that's when the Hasidic Jews come. Uh -huh. So you come out, and there's like a, a team of people waiting to get autographs. Yeah. And there's a bunch of Hasidic Jews there. And I look down, I'm signing autographs, yeah. and there's a little boy with the payas wrapped around yeah. his ears and just staring up at me with these saucer-like eyes. And I just said, Cookie, are you okay? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, are you really Jewish? <laughs> and I just, of course, I burst out crying, and I said, yeah, I'm Jewish. Yeah, I'm really Jewish, <laughs> and I signed his and I signed his playbill, and I thought, so there's a life I changed there. It's going to be the same as my seeing Jews right on stage. Right now he's going to see Jews on stage. That's something. And he's going to believe there's a place in the world. Yeah, you know. Whereas my greatest fear, I think, was that somebody was going to say, you know, why why, why could a, a get an openly gay man like you play Tevya? Which would be a ridiculous question anyway. What else would a man in those days do? Yeah. <laughs> right. They were going to announce, you know what? I can't, I can't feed the cows and I can't do So I'm going to put on a drag show in town. <laughs> That's, it's not the way it worked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You were going to get married and have children no matter what. Right. So it's just not the way it worked. Right. So, so, because when Rosie O'Donnell came in to play my wife for yeah. a while, I thought, now this is the perfect couple. <laughs> Yeah. This is the absolute perfect Hasidic couple. Uh, that's beautiful. A gay man and a gay woman yeah. having five daughters. It's great. This is, yeah. And uh, sobriety's good? Yes. Well, sobriety's rebirth. And I've been, it's been, how long have you been? 26. I'm 20, let me 23. Yeah. Wow. Almost the same time. I did it. I got sober in New York. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the places. You yeah. did my time at Perry Street. You did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I got sober in, in a small fictional town in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. But I had already had five years of, of Al-Anon. Oh, yeah. So I knew what I was going to get into. But I really, it really was a rebirth for me. And, and, and every day since has been this new life. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a myth. You still go to the things? Um, there's a, there's a, a beginners meeting that I still go to. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to find like I, there was like I I, I underlined two things in the book. Uh, 
I found the book to be, you know, inspirational and entertaining and touching. I loved it, man. Oh, thanks. Well, most, you know, most showbiz books, I don't, I like to, I don't like to think of it as a showbiz book, but they start out with the, I went to the theater and I saw a guy on the stage yeah. and I said, that's going to be me. But as you know, that was never going to be me. I never wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to be a writer. This is what life does if you say yes. This is it. Oh. My personality is simply too addictive. I don't love. I obsess. I don't share. I possess. I don't partner. I control. What more proof do you need than my confession to mourning the loss of Sam for 10 years? I wonder if I have the capacity to heal. It's heavy, man. Like, you know yourself. I mean, this is the thing about sobriety. That that's what you're going to, you know, you, you had the, the five years to get your mind back, all that. But eventually, you can't hide from yourself anymore. No. No. And this, which, is, this which, is hard stuff. Right. But that's why it makes it easier to write. Yeah. Because you've been there. You've you've had to do that to get sober. Yeah. But like those kind of, uh, like, I, I guess I'm up against that now in my own life about, you know, what do I want for the future and what, you know. Well, we all, that's that's the great part is if you're clean and you're sober. Yeah. You can actually ask that question. Yeah. And you might be able to come up with an all new answer that never was before. But when I was using... I couldn't ask what I wanted yeah. next because I was just going to get more of the same. Yeah, but the self acceptance is the hardest part. You know, yeah. when, you know, when you're sober. I mean, that's it. Because the, yeah. the sadness of realization that, like, I'm wired this way. Right. And anything that I'm going to do to be happy is going to be against this wiring. Oh, I mean, the painters that I know that, um, and, and, uh, and other artists, yeah. some writers and, that just felt they couldn't create unless they were drunk. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, the nice part for me was I couldn't create anything if I was drunk. Whatever I typed out when I was drunk, I looked at the next day and went, mm -hmm. don't bother. There's a, you're wasting your time. You got more honest, right? Sober. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I, I, but I knew where I was. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I was dying. Right. I mean, I, I was di I was dying. I was physically yeah. dying. Yeah. I drove into a fucking garage and ran the car. I was dying. Yeah, you tried. You, you tried I, to off myself. You, yeah. you earnestly tried to do it. You were yeah. you were ready. Oh yeah, I was done. Yeah. I was done. As I say to people, to, uh, people who really are done, they don't write notes. Yeah, they don't yeah. write notes because whatever you write in a note, people are going to go, "That's wrong. It's not true." Right. <laughs> so yeah. I bother arguing. But it didn't work. No, because I'm too stupid. <laughs> I didn't, I mean, I literally did it wrong, or I wouldn't be here. I did it wrong. Instead, I almost killed the dog. <laughs> Instead of killing myself, I was killed the dog. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy you didn't kill yourself. I'm glad. Love well, it. I've had a lovely time out here in Glen, Glen, Glen Clary, Glen Ross. Oh, come on. It was nice. It's a lo it's lovely. It's California. Yeah. yeah. Can I go? Did I pay my dues yet? Yeah, you're can down. Go you're down. Can We're I go going. back home to you can go back to Connecticut, to Connecticut and sit to my small my yeah. small fictional town yeah. in Connecticut. Say hi to Billy for me. Oh, well, he's here in L.A. Yeah, I know. I know. Are you going to see him now? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice talking to you. Going to church. Nice talking to you. Okay, that was that was Harvey. All right, Cookie. Okay, Cookie. Okay. Harvey. <laughs> Good book. Uh, it's called I Was Better Last Night, a memoir. Get it wherever you get your books. Uh, go to WTFPod.com slash tour for all the tour dates. And uh, if anybody can give me any information about what happened to Gary Orgel, I'm, I'm sure he's passed. I'm pretty confident of that. Um, but let me know. Uh, and if you know anything, tell me anything about that guy. He was a big part of my life. He, he gave me a, 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 a book of photographs called Legends by a guy who took pictures of stars. And I just remember in it, he says, um, you know, become a legend or something like that. And there were, for years, I was just sort of like, fuck, I'm not a legend yet. And disappoint Gary. And I don't know if he lived long enough. To know that I became a legend, because I'm a fucking legend. Here's some guitar.